Keith, thank you for um, running us through. And I really liked your, your kind of five principles at the end. So if I might, I'd like to just maybe pick up on the point around Adam Smith. Um, so I, I'm a big fan of Adam Smith. And I do worry sometimes that he's been woefully misinterpreted. And everybody focuses on uh, the wealth of nations when in fact he, he has written more than one book. And indeed it was the theory of moral sentiments um, which is the book that goes alongside the wealth of nations and they ought to be read in conjunction with each other. Uh, and that was written almost 20 years before. And I, I wonder if in reflecting on the works of Adam Smith, that perhaps we need to remember some of that moral sentiments piece as well and remember the, the moral purpose of markets. And I wondered if there's anything further you wanted to touch on um, around Adam Smith and the role that his thinking can have in helping us rethink the role of markets as they're meant to serve society. Yeah, th thank you. And I, I agree. I, I, I think the two need to be um, taken, uh, taken together. And um, I think that that sense of purpose also needs to lie right at the heart of a responsible and sustainable corporate uh, corporate sector. And I know a lot of a lot of good work is uh, is being done on, on 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 that front. In terms of Smith specifically, you know, he was he was a man of his time, but um, we also kind of need to remember that when you look back at his time, markets were very fragmented. Smith was interested in markets and interested in market failure. And he never was applying a one size fits all solution across all markets and suggesting that unfettered um, self-interest and, 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 and greed uh, was, uh, the, uh, was the appropriate way, uh, way forward. And so, you know, I, I think modern scholars kind of look at Smith and, 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 and say, well, yeah, we, you have to look at individual markets and, and, and where they fail. And actually you have to think about where you can connect that failure with uh, with, uh, with 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 purpose. The the, um, the 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 point Smith was making about uh, the invisible hand was was actually a point in in the wealth of nations where he was suggesting you didn't need controls over export because the risks associated with being uh, 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 of taking too much risk with uh, uh, with foreign trade was apparent to everybody so you didn't need to over uh, overdo it um, so it was about risk it, it wasn't actually about the price mechanism that's great and I, I think there's a couple of key points that you touched on in there that kind of come up again in your five principles, particularly around this kind of social license aspect. So if I might just touch on that for a moment. Um, I think it's really interesting when we start to look at the rights um, that we've, we've given corporations to the point where corporations can now sue nation states if nation states put in laws that limit their ability to earn money through um, the destruction of the planet or different things like that. And I wonder if perhaps we've gone too far um, and, and is there a need, and this is, comes on to some of the questions that are starting to appear in the chat, is there a need for a circuit breaker? At what point do we call time on a company? Um, and how do we determine when it's really breached its social license? And, and who, who should control that? How do we form that view? I, 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 I guess, you know, there's, there's um, yeah, the undefined is, you know, when it, when it, um, when it, when it is doing things that are not in favor of the common good that is that is broadly defined and that that common good i think has to go across you know the whole group of of of, of, of stakeholders suppliers customers uh the communities that that, that, that people operate in and i, and I you know, it's difficult to define but i do think you know we are starting to get a sense of the common good as we come out of the, uh, the, 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 the pandemic. You know, for sure, bits of that stuff can start to be embedded in, um, in uh, regulation and in deals that are done. And I think we're starting to see that with you know, some of the things that are going on with the media and Facebook. It, 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 it's very, uh, it's very early, uh, early days. But ultimately, this is the product of political 
economy. You know, we'll end up getting the regulation uh, we uh, we deserve. So I think it's really, really important that 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 that, that voices voices are uh, voices are heard. Thanks, Keith. Um, it sounds like an excellent opportunity for the financial sector to redeem itself um, from the global financial crash and put itself at the heart of our recovery plans. Uh, and just picking up on that principal and agent problem and, and your new role, and I know you're speaking in your own personal capacity, but the FRC has done some great work uh, with the new Stewardship Code 2020. And what we've seen with that is a real kind of shift in focus to remind asset owners that they need to get involved in that too. And I wondered if you might touch on what you think some of the benefits are of getting the asset owner really involved in what good looks like uh, and taking more control over this agenda. I, I think because it, 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 it's, you know, um, I think it's, uh, it's relatively simple. Um, everybody is going to have to take more responsibility for their own finances. You know, one of the sad side effects of the uh, of the pandemic is that we are going to be living in a society that's burdened with public debt for a very, very long uh, period of, 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 of time. So I think the fashion was against, um, you know, state support. It'll, it'll be economically tougher. I think actually connecting uh investment investment return uh with uh somebody's savings and the fact that they can have a positive impact and they can have uh an impact on the common good whilst building wealth saving for you know a uh a, a, a well-funded retirement or or a set of, of of wealth events is incredibly important and i think we have to be transparent about how we do that and i think we have to offer end safer end savers uh choice um it's been difficult because it's been complex in the past but we now have the technology to help us to uh, to do that, so it, you know, I think this is also about building a narrative that there's never been a more important time to invest in your future and the economy's future, and it's your savings that will facilitate those investments. That's a story actually you only usually hear after uh, or during uh, during wartime. So yes. enrolling people you know, in investments. And I see that um, we've got the Treasury on the same page. So looking to issue the equivalent of war bonds to um, fund the recovery certainly brings back that kind of ethos of we're all in this together and we need to uh, fund a future that we want to live in instead of some kind of dystopian novel that none of us wants to retire into. I'm going to come back with a couple of my questions later because we've got so many questions in the chat here and they're really good. So I'm going to have to go over and see if I can do this thing of read and come back to you at the same time. Um, so picking on, up on that theme of, you know, social license around companies, question from John Holland. Should the financial aims of financial firms be subordinated to net zero aims? I don't think they can be just uh, subordinated to net zero aims, but I do think that that broader issue of sustainability, uh, of which the move to uh, a net zero uh, environment is an important part, should be a critical part of the way in which a company, a firm, sets its business model, sets its strategy, and delivers a return associated with the way in which it mitigates uh, it mitigates those uh, mitigates those uh, those risks. So it's only by taking that 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 broad approach to sustainability that we'll avoid, you know, um, sometimes the uh, unintended consequences of focusing on a singular, uh, a singular metric. But there's no doubt it's a very, very important part of sustainability. Just to push on that one a little further. So on, as we journey down this road to net zero, 
the actions that we take in this decade are really going to shape the century to come. And stewardship is great when we engage with companies to try and drive change, and many describe it as the carrot. At what point is there a stick? Um, and coming back to that point of net zero, do you imagine that we'll get to a point where FTSE, for example, will delist companies that haven't demonstrated alignment to Paris by 2040, for example? Or do you think that's a step too far for regulators and, and listing markets to, to go? So, so I, 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 I think if it gets to the point where, in essence, you know, like, like in, in corporate governance, you have a no vote or you have to delist, you've lost the argument and you've lost the game. Uh, and, and actually what we do need to do is you know, have a combination of carrots and sticks. So you know, getting uh, corporates to think about how they decarbonize, how they de-risk their business model and uh, an acceptance that, that if they do that, they'll get rewarded with good finance to promote and, 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 and help them deliver a sustainable future for their business. If they don't, the cost of finance will rise and in essence, they'll end up being, um, you know, potentially starved of, uh, starved of finance. So, you know, there's a means of generating a, 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 a transition. And, and you, can, you can see some of that, um, you know, starting to, to come through. In, in, in the pricing of, 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 of equities, bonds, and, 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 and stuff that's carbon related. It's not, it's not perfect, but actually it's incumbent upon us all to start that process and insist and demand that action is taken, ask for um, transparent uh metrics that they're going to report against and then reward those that deliver against those plans and penalize you know those who are either not transparent or uh, or, or or don't or don't deliver that brings us on nicely to um a question from andrew ross and um, i'm just going to add some color to it as well so his question is who is responsible for greening the economy and we've we've talked a little bit about the role of corporates but there are others in this system um, and kind of my perception is that we are at a critical juncture in the politics of climate change. Um, we've got COP26 coming up and the key article from the Paris Agreement that hasn't yet been agreed is Article 6, which outlines carbon trading. And if we had a price on carbon, we would have the incentives to drive different behavior. What do you see as the role for politicians in this really important year? And, and if I can be controversial, do you think we're up to it? The UK has the stage. Are we going to say and do the right things or are we going to bungle it? I don't think it's black. I don't think it's black and white. So I, I don't think the uh, the future of, 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 of climate change and decarbonisation will depend on you know a a particular conference in a particular year what i think is important is that we seize the moment we seize the change in public attitude to create momentum behind you know these apparent shifts and make sure they're embedded in policy so so actually you know when we look back uh, from 2036 to 20, uh, 2021, actually, we can see that we have embedded policies in place that have generated uh, that have generated programs. So it's progress. So you know, I think this is a real case of 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 of, of, of carpe uh, carpe diem. I think the other thing we need to accept uh, is we won't be perfect on day one. That, that actually, you know, there will be mistakes. And as, as we um, think about, uh, you know, the way in which we report and we think about the policies, you know, we will improve kind of through, uh, through time. So, you know, I think this is, um, you know, hopefully we're beyond the beginning of the journey, but, you know, momentum should be, uh, momentum should be building. And, and that's what I think, the opportunity that surrounds the whole COP process 
is uh, is about. Uh, I have to say, you know, so far, um, so good. The UK seems to be throwing quite a lot of it and is looking to make a sustainable uh, a sustainable fest of it. We've certainly seen seen the race to zero um, setting the pace, and a lot of announcements from big organisations um, setting a 2050 ambition for for net zero. Um, I guess the devil is in the detail and the actions that they take over the next 10 years. Um, I wondered if you could maybe just touch on. So we've talked a little bit about the kind of economic theory, and I wondered if we could just come back to kind of the role of markets and. What we've seen over the last oh, probably more than 20 years, I feel like everything's 20 years, but now I'm getting old, so it's probably more. We've seen this huge rise in passive investing, and by passive, I mean market weight investing. And I wondered to what extent, um, you know, it's nearly over 50% of the market, is, is that sustainable as we're trying to rapidly transition um, away from a high carbon intensive company to uh, country and economy into a lower carbon economy? What's the role for active investing um, and, and how does passive investing potentially distort the market as we go through this journey? Um, yeah, just your, your thoughts on passive and active and the roles that they might play. Yeah, so I have to say, I, 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 I think the distinction between active and passive is, is um, uh, a little bit too stark. I, I always think about, you know, the, the, the kind of risk return uh, spectrum. But when you're looking to generate change and, 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 and force change, then I think active has a very, very uh, significant role uh, to play because you can concentrate uh, your investments on, on, on who you think uh, the future uh, successes uh, will be. You can reward people for um you know with 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 invest with your capital being invested when it's aligned to your particular investment uh investment philosophy so you know, in the context of the current issues we're talking about the really important thing here is esg factors including climate change should be embedded in the investment processes of uh active managers if all you're doing is following a you know a trend following or uh, uh, a, a, a momentum strategy, that isn't going to do you uh, much uh, much good as well. Um, passive investing has the advantage that if we're talking about index investing, you know it, it is it is relatively cheap and efficient for the end uh, the end investor, and and whilst those um, investments are, are are kind of passive in in in, in, in that sense, that doesn't mean that large scale passive investors can't play their role in generating change in policy, you know, lobbying for, as you were suggesting, what's in or out of uh, the index. Uh, putting pressure on uh, the index uh, providers, looking to shape uh, government uh, policy about who can, uh, should uh, and shouldn't you know, be listed in the UK or the premium segments of, uh, of, uh, of the market. So you can have an investment philosophy, uh, I, I think, that, that, that does have, uh, that does have, uh, does have impact. I hope those asset managers who have big passive portfolios were taking notes at that point. I'm going to come on to a different area of questioning, and this is more on the social aspect. So I think there's been a lot of focus in, in previous years on the G in ES and G. Climate is having its moment, um, so the E is in focus, but this kind of tricky S aspect. Um, and I think alongside um, this S aspect, we've also seen an uptick in engagement across societies from both the Scottish Climate Assembly kind of engaging with citizens through to the Just Transition Commission engaging with citizens as well on their views. Um, and there's a, a provocative question from John Miller, which says, thinking about the S in ESG, would you agree that the investment industry has both contributed to and benefited from the long-term growth in income inequality. And then I will tack on a, and so what should we do about that at the end? 
I think yes. I mean, the, the answer is yes. We, you know, we we have benefited and, uh, as an industry, benefited it, and been part of it. And and I and I think that's in, um, you know, probably uh, three uh, three senses. You know, one, um, this has been a an industry which has risen through time. So you know, it hasn't had products and pricing policies that have been commoditized so it's been very uh, it's been very profitable and therefore those working in the industry have benefited uh, from uh, from that uh, I think the uh, the other uh, issue is is obviously we have benefited from globalization which was quite a, uh, a strong uh, a strong rising trend and the deregulation that, that, that took place from, from, from kind of 79 onwards. But I think the other thing that's really, really important here is to recognize and accept, and I guess it was part of Tom R. Piketty's uh, thesis, that um, financial return uh, is typically you know, add a premium to the return on uh, return on wages and uh, because the financial industry has benefited uh, from 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 that and more sophisticated exposure then uh, there's undoubtedly you know uh, a sort of benefit from the income inequality and of course you know, you have to add into that all this liquidity post the financial crisis that's been pumped into financial markets via QE has lifted uh, the price of financial assets relative to um, assets in the rest of society. And that, that's been the benefit. The question then, you're absolutely right, is what do we do about it? What do we do about it? And, and I, I believe with a vengeance that this is not about taxing. It's about financial uh, inclusion. It's about making sure that finance plays its role in making those attractive returns available to everybody in uh, in 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 society. You know, it's whether it, 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 it you know it's so, so so you know that that is partly about pricing. It's partly about the way in which, as you were suggesting, we enroll people in. And it's also getting back to something that we seem to forget about in the, uh, in, 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 in the 2000s and, 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 and the late 1990s, that right at the essence of um, capitalism is this collectivization of savings which pools risk and pools risk for the common good. We have spent so much time hypothecating uh, risk and identifying and measuring it that actually some of those pooling mechanisms, which have been to the benefit of uh, uh, society, um, have gone by uh, the wayside. So I think as an industry, the asset management industry needs to have right at its forefront um uh you know uh, a purpose which is about diversity and inclusion it's about great. savings work better great great response there and i, I don't know if you can see the questions because it's like you're leading straight into the next question um from sheila and apologies if i've said, said your name incorrectly sheila o'reilly I've got two more questions for you because we are getting close to time. So apologies to all of those that I'm not going to get to. I'll try um, to so Sheila has asked about how do you, so he, she references your use of the collectivization of savings, which is great. Um, but she wonders how we might go about identifying what public good is, given that it's highly contested. Um, and then I guess the, the second question, and I'll give them both to you now because they might link together, is from Nigel Kershaw around yes it's great that we're making ESG mainstream in the finance sector but how on earth do we make that understandable to people so that we win their hearts and minds how do we take them on that journey um so yeah how do we know what good is and how do we take people on the journey uh I wish I knew the answer to uh you know what uh, what good is it good in 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 finance I think is is stuff that doesn't do harm that promotes prosperity 
and by which I would mean sort of long-term health and well-being. And in, in technically, I think one of the things you're looking to avoid is volatility. So if you get sustainability of return right, you don't get the dislocation and blow ups in corporates that result in um, you know, the likes of uh, Carillion, uh, for instance, which causes economic dislocation, loses jobs, uh, et cetera. So, so, so actually sustainability is absolutely the key. Uh, fantastic question from, 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 from Nigel. I think it's very simple that 